Hey, if you've been hanging around a while, you know we've been going through a series called Holy Dust here, and it's really a series through the book of Mark, learning to learning what does it mean to follow Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, that we can learn from him and learn to do life as he does and and respond in ways he would respond. And it's been a great series. Uh, we're, we're starting to wrap that up. Um, and then at the end of August, we're actually going to launch another series, just a short one called Mind Control. How to take control of your thought life. Anybody ever struggle with that? So, um, but that, that'll be great. But the book of Mark's been uh, wonderful for us. Um, also, we just launched life groups, uh, community groups around here. And uh, woo, woo, woo. Uh, if you're involved in one, uh, they've just been taking off like crazy. Really good. So if you're looking, just uh, listen, uh, besides being a, a pastor, you know, I do a lot of counseling. And one thing I've really learned over the years of pastoring and counseling is I bet 80% of the counseling things that get to my office wouldn't have gotten there if people would have just had meaningful, significant, and trusting relationship with four or five people. I just see it all the time, right? And if you're in recovery, you, you kind of get that. If, uh, you know, and, and I'm talking just people that you can be real with, right? That can call you out on your crap, that can help you to uh, grow, and know and go. So uh, that's what our community groups are about. Um, we, we got those relaunched after COVID just a little bit ago. We had to find uh, a leader, somebody who could, was wise enough to help coordinate them and manage herd cats, basically. Uh, we had to find somebody who had a heart for community, knew what real authentic relationship was about, and God raised up this gentleman through Next Level Leadership, and one of our values here is when people step into leadership, we try to communicate a message here that transparency is more important than just your gifting, right? That's learning to just be a real human being and not put on a mask because you're a leader uh, is really important to us. And so... One thing that we do with leadership here is we ask people when you step into a role, uh, you get to share your life with us. So we see you as more than just some ridiculously good-looking, smart person, but that you actually have a heart also. So anyway, Dan, Dan has taken over our community groups, but more important, Dan has a testimony that makes him one of us. And so give Dan a hand. Here he is. Good morning, church. Good morning, man. Uh, before I get started, I just want to take a minute to pray. So, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to share my story. Um, we say a lot around here, um, you know, what you've told us through revelations, that we overcome the enemy by the power of the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony, Father. So, thank you for giving me the opportunity to partner with you and chip in away at the enemy. Um, we also say a lot around here, Father, that uh, you'll interrupt service to speak to one person. Um, so I ask, if it's just the one today, Father, we'll take it. But hopefully the, um, the story that you have through me will touch more than that. So um, just bless our time together here this morning, Father, and uh, guide my words. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah, you can do it! <laughs> So as uh, Eric mentioned, I've kind of stepped up to lead the community groups. I've had the honor of leading the men's group here for about a year now. Cap is one of those. I love you, brother. Thank you. That was very encouraging. Um, I also have decided if I ever got on stage and my mother was in the crowd, I'd have to say, Mom, I love you. Thanks for being here. This life has been one heck of a ride, and I'm very grateful you gave it to me. Thank you, Mom. Amen. Um, so just kind of sharing, uh, you know, my 26 years of running away from the Lord, and then uh, the last, you know, six or seven or so where he's 
managed to finally get a hold of me. Um, so grew up born and raised Catholic, so part of that is sacraments. You go through baptism as a baby. You move on, learn how to confess your sins in reconciliation. You uh, partake in communion. Uh, and so I got drugged to church every Sunday um, to go to classes and figure all that out. I remember one time hiding under my bed because I didn't want to go that badly. And it wasn't until I heard my parents say, well, I guess we can call the cops, that I was like, no, I'm right here. Um, so after I went through confirmation, which is basically the conferring of the gifts of the Spirit uh, later in life after baptism, uh, my parents told me, well, you don't have to go to church anymore if you don't want to. So I said, cool, I'm out. Um, there's plenty of things on this planet that can fill my bucket. And uh, that was about the time I started smoking cigarettes and you know, spent paycheck after paycheck as a teenager trying to get somebody 18 or older. I think it's 21 now. Can you guys believe that? That's crazy. Um, 18 or older to help feed my, my addiction for nicotine. Um, I always held on to my belief that there was a creator, father, um, never doubted God's existence. I just never pursued him. Um, as a friend or, a, or the father. Um, I just always struggled with Jesus being the resurrected son of God. Um, so I held on to it over the years. Oh, I don't need to go to church. I've got the trails. I can go hiking. I can go fishing. Uh, that's my church. Uh, and I still firmly believe that. But I love coming here. Don't get me wrong. Um, one of my biggest wounds as I started coming to Christ was realizing uh, I have big wounds of abandonment that started very early on. Um, my uh, family can attest to the fact that I'm kind of a sensitive baby. Uh, <laughs> so uh, breakups hit me really hard. Uh, dated a woman through high school. We broke up shortly after starting college. Um, kind of kicked me further down the line. Uh, started smoking marijuana at that point. Um, Shortly after that, I started dating a young woman who actually had a very great relationship with Christ. Um, and when we bro that was about the same time I started experimenting with substances outside of marijuana and tobacco and alcohol. Um, and that created a huge rift between us. And when we broke up, uh, I always blamed her, her faith for making her think that I was this like pot smoking heathen, right? Um, so, at that point when we broke up, I started opening my Bible kind of out of spite more than anything else. So where does it say in this book that I can't smoke pot, right? Um, never did find the answer to that, by the way. But <laughs> other than the fact of all the reminders of stay sober-minded, be watchful, um, I just never found anything that condemned me or disqualified me from God's love because of that. Um, and I still hid, hid that in shame, never really shared it openly um, over the years. But that breakup pushed me into a pretty dark place to where I almost committed suicide at that point. Um, I was considering ways to take my own life. Um, and the night that I decided, okay, I'm gonna do this, let me figure out how that's gonna go down. Uh, I got a phone call from a buddy who said, hey man, we're hanging out at a friend's house tonight, come out, have a beer, hang out. Um, and just never turned back. I'd never hung out with this group of people before. Um, ended up actually joining that community of people. And that uh, gentleman who saved my life is actually here today um, with his family. Amen. Um, Amen. So I still continued from that point forward seeking companionship and joy from pretty much anything and everything other than God. Um, was dating a woman at the time uh, who helped me. She came from like two generations of pastors and um, kind of could still feel God pulling and reaching for me. Uh, she was uh, in my life at the time that my 15-year-old uh, cousin Grant died from cancer. He had uh, been diagnosed when he was seven or eight years old, so he spent about half his life uh, fighting cancer before he finally decided he was done with the chemo and the radiation and all the treatments. Uh, and I really struggled with my faith at that time of if there is a God, how could he let something this horrible happen to a child? 
I uh, watched my aunt and uncle get a divorce. His sister struggled through depression for many, many, many years. Um, and I, it was, wasn't until, shoot, four years ago or so now that I started to see how God was going to work that for good. Um, so continuing down the abandonment piece of it, um, that girlfriend and I, she was there, went out to funeral with me, was very supportive. We ended up getting married. Um, instead of sharing Jesus in our life, we were sharing drugs and going to parties. And um, We ended up getting divorced after a year into our marriage, uh, feeling kind of unworthy. And at the same time that we were supposed to get together to sign our paperwork, fill out the divorce things and go through that, um, got a call that my grandfather had passed away unexpectedly from complications from surgery. Um, so the night I was supposed to go start a divorce process, I had to go to a funeral. And probably when I wanted God least in my life, I was drawn right back into the Catholic Church where I was raised. I got to see organization after organization honor my grandfather for his contributions to his country, to his church, to his community, to the sick. Um, and really sparked in me the desire to believe, even though I was struggling to do so. Um, throughout that healing process, I still didn't really have a cornerstone with Christ in my life. Um, I was still drinking, still smoking, uh, lashed out at a lot of my friends, um, went home with random women from bars, um, again, just not going to God for the healing that I needed. Um, our friend group kind of fell apart. Everybody started getting divorced and, um, you know, everybody was debating, you know, which ones were justified, which ones were unfair. Um, and we've kind of all gone our separate ways. And throughout that process, I wound up feeling almost pretty much alone with the exception of about three friends. Again, the gentleman who saved my life many years ago and my two roommates were also here. Love seeing you guys. So it's about this time that um, I really, whenever I go through a struggle, I throw myself into work really is where I go to to distract myself. Um, so really stepped up at work, working long hours over time, putting on the mask that like everything's okay despite all of these, you know, deaths and divorces and late nights and my boss had turned to me at one point, she's like, you know, you should really write a book about how you're dealing with all of this. Like, how are you not just crumbling apart? Um, and again, I had the mask on, so I wasn't willing to even admit that it wasn't okay. Um, but I started thinking about wholeness, fulfillment, like what does that actually look like? And kind of leaned back on my martial arts upbringing. Uh, my parents had us enrolled in that for a few years. And they always had heart, mind, body, soul um, as like four pillars. And then it was uh, about a year later, somebody shared the great commandment with me. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Um, so I really focused that into how do I show love to myself first before I can share love with others. Um, and this is really when I've started feeling God, that desire for a relationship with God actually turning into a relationship, an actual relationship where I was seeking and he was responding. Um, as I started fleshing out some of these pieces, I really was eager to share them with somebody. Um, and the, one of the people I had in mind for that was actually my brother who mentioned several times about feeling like a black hole inside or um, just clearly struggling for, to find joy as I had for so many years. Um, and before I had the courage to share those things with them, uh, he actually passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. Um, the morning my parents and I found him in his apartment, um, I had come to church with some friends. And it was the first time I heard the sentiment that the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in you also. And that was such a powerful thing to carry me through that season as my parents and my sister and I all tried to find a way forward with such an unexpected thing. You don't expect a 32-year-old to 
not be able to call him and play video games again, not be able to give him a hug again. Um, you know, that it really hit me. Uh, and for him, not having a relationship with Christ, I always struggle with, do I ever get to see him again? Um, you know, is this, was this the only time that I had with him was here on earth? Um, so that kind of started to ignite in me a passion to share God with others. But there was still this lingering problem. So I wasn't sure about this Jesus of Nazareth being the risen son of God. Um, seemed like a cool guy, super smart. There's a lot of wisdom in the Gospels, very compassionate person. The miracles had a bit of a wow factor, feeding, you know, 5,000 people with a basket of bread and fish. Um, and the wedding at Cana, I mean, I want a glass of that wine for sure. <laughs> so about this time, Game of Thrones was really big. And there was, uh, all the characters were vying for you to bend the knee. Uh, who is going to sit on the throne? Who is going to be the ruler? And that year we had watched Passion of the Christ. Uh, and as I was watching that, so well done of Mary mopping the blood up off the stone and Jesus getting struck over and over again and just picking the cross back up and pushing forward. I said, you know, if I was going to bend the knee to somebody, it could be that guy. Come on. Uh, Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Even if I don't believe he was the risen son of God, he did. He walked into it for me, for you, Amen. for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll bow day in and day out to a guy like that. Um, so from there, it wasn't too big of a hop, skip, and a jump from King of Kings to Lord of Lords. Um, as he slowly started peeling off my chains of addiction on nicotine. I've been almost two years nicotine free hey, hey, without bro. smoking or drinking. Um, my few of us last year uh, from the men's group, we threw in our marijuana pipes into the trunk up here. Amen. Yeah. Um, That's a big deal. Yeah. So it was very apparent to me that this man is who everybody proclaimed he is, who he is, who he said he was. Um, he's our savior. He's my savior and king. Um, so throughout all these trials and everything, uh, the one constant I had my go-to every single day uh, was my best friend, who was also um, just my rock. He was always excited when I came home. Um, and... Uh, learned a lot through that process of losing him. He had a degenerative disease where he was slowly going paralyzed. So I saw it coming and I was able to brace for it. Um, and I, I see that as a gift from God that I was able to lean into him to pray through that loss. It wasn't abrupt like all the other ones were. Um, and I learned a lot about idols through that process. Of it was finally time for God to take his place as the center of my life. Amen. There was no other distractions. It was all about him and me and getting me through it. Um, and it was the community here. I got texts from several Seth and Eric and friends all day long. You know, hey, we're praying for you. We love you. Um, let us know if you need anything. Uh, had my Bibles and my devotionals sitting out when the vet showed up at the house to put them down. And he sent, the vet sent me a Bible quote from Ecclesiastes. None of us are better than the beasts. We all go to the same place. Um, and uh, it was... I could feel God through every second of that loss. Um, and he doesn't beat around the bush with it. You know, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Yeah. Um, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You have kept count of my tossings. Put your tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? Um, it's very plain that we will experience suffering. Um, but the Bible also has promises of hope. You know, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And that last one is definitely one suffering so much death in my life. Um, it just gives me so much hope to be in paradise with our king. Um, kind of want to close with an uh, ex excerpt from a devotional, uh, New Morning Mercies. 
David Paul trip. Um, the entry was actually from April 22nd. If God had intended for all the days of your life to be easy, they would be. Know in grace he intends for your days to be his tools of refinement. I am deeply persuaded that many of us struggle with questions of God's goodness, faithfulness, and love, not because he has been unfaithful to any promise in any way, but because we simply are not on his agenda page. Our agenda, our definition of what a good God should give us is a life that is comfortable, pleasurable, and predictable. One in which there's lots of human affirmation and an absence of suffering. God is not working to deliver you your personal definition of happiness. If you're on that agenda page, you're going to be disappointed with God, and you're going to wonder if he loves you. God is after something better, your holiness. That is the final completion of his redemptive work in you. The difficulties you face are not in the way of God's plan. They do not show the failure of God's plan, and they are not signs he has turned his back on you. No, those moments are a sure sign of the zeal of his redemptive love. Wow. Amen. Amen. I'd like to ask the uh, worship team to come back up, um, and also the prayer team, uh, for anybody who suffers with grief or loss or um, thoughts of, you know, disillusionment of, is God there? Does he hear me? Um, just come up for some prayer. Uh, we'll be able to do that with you. Uh, and just a reminder, but even in all of the mess and the madness, God's goodness is still there. You know, when my brother passed, my nephew was born. Um, I'm in a season right now of just tremendous outpouring of God's gifts and love, the community that he's provided me. Um, you know, after my divorce, I just prayed continually for a strong, joyful, patient woman, kids, a job. He's provided all of them in the last six months. Um, God is just so, so good, you guys. And in, in the darkness, he is the light. And even in your darkest time, you can be a light for others. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. 